uh, Chile's Universidad Católica del Val de Valparaíso and Mission Blue, I'm pleased to welcome our participants as well as you in the audience to this wonderful event. What brings us together with what is truly an amazing lineup of environmentalists is a major new study from Cambridge University that is called Protecting 30% of the Planet for Nature, Costs, Benefits, and Economic Implications. The research for this report involved more than 100 economists and scientists from the United States, Canada, the UK, Australia, Japan, and China. I may have missed a few, but those are the ones that stood out to me. This major collaborative work, which is here represented and will be presented by Anthony Waldron, um, takes up the Global Biodiversity Framework's proposal that to address the risk of climate change, conservation areas should increase and be expanded to 30% of the Earth's surface by the year 2030, hence the term 20 by 30. But there are obvious concerns about what that would cost and what the impact would be on the region's agriculture, forestry, and fisheries sectors, which are major sources of revenue throughout Latin America and the Caribbean. I won't get into too many of the details, but the report demonstrates that the expansion of protected areas outperforms the non-expansion of these areas in mitigating the very large economic risks of climate change and biodiversity loss. This is really a critical point because throughout the region, there have been tense discussions about the trade-offs between economic development and the establishment of large-scale conservation initiatives to protect these fragile and highly biodiverse ecosystems. And these discussions in light of COVID-19 have probably never been more important as the virus devastates livelihoods and economies throughout the hemisphere. Before turning things over to our moderator, Marcelo Mena, who is Chile's former Minister of the Environment and currently directs the Center for Climate Action at the Catholic University in Valparaíso, I'd like to welcome and briefly introduce our panelists. As I mentioned, Anthony Waldron is the lead author of the 30 by 30 study and is joining us now from Cambridge University in the UK. The Honorable Jose Maria Figueres is the former president of Costa Rica, which is a country that is really synonymous in the Americas with environmental protection. Sylvia Earle is the president of Mission Blue, and she is former director of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration in the United States. Chris Tompkins, great to see you again, is the president of Tompkins Conservation, whose donation of private land in Chile for conservation purposes sets a historic precedent. And finally, Max Bello, who was a Wilson Center Global Fellow and Oceans Champion for the upcoming COP26 conference. Max, congratulations again on the birth of your daughter. Um, Marcelo, I turn over the microphone if you could unmute, thanks. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Cynthia. And thank you uh, for all the panelists um, participating today. It's really exciting to have this, uh, this uh, seminar considering uh, how important this study is for all who have been uh, fighting for conservation, in which we have governments that need to balance short-term urgencies like today with long-term visions that allow us to have more uh, broader prosperity. In this regard, uh, Anthony Waldron's uh, study comes right at the moment in which we are negotiating whether we should go uh, to expand 30% of our planet in the context of the Biodiversity Conference. And the evidence that he provides is, yes, we should, because if we don't keep a, a stabilized relationship with the environment, we could end up all stuck at home in a global pandemic. So it, it comes at a great time. So I, uh, the, the, the seminar today will have essentially two, uh, two parts. One will be a, a, a keynote speech by uh, Anthony Waldron, and then we'll have a, a panel uh, with Chris, Chris uh, Jose Maria, and Sylvia, and Max uh, to follow. So Anthony, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. 
I'd just like to give a little background first. Often when you hear that an academic study has arrived, it could mean that it's simply of academic interest. The purpose of this study was that this year and now postponed until next year, the governments of the world are due to sit down and work out for the next 10-year plan the strategy they're going to carry out to try and stop the ongoing loss of biodiversity. We might have seen some news headlines recently about the extinction being possible of another million species. Now, the governments have floated as an idea the thought that perhaps we should expand our protected areas, our conservation areas, to much greater than they currently are in an attempt to actually halt the, the loss of biodiversity. That, of course, did raise certain concerns for them, not least economic concerns. And so they actually came to the team and they said, could you tell us, firstly, what this might cost and secondly, what the economic implications might be? Because although we're very interested in doing this for the environment and biodiversity and indeed climate change, there are, of course, these economic concerns. So this study is actually coming out of a desire by world governments to know answers to these questions. So I'm just going to share a few slides. Now, conservation areas, protected areas, we, the study called them protected areas, and you may not be familiar with these. So this is basically what protected areas are. Areas such as Yellowstone National Park, um, an elephant wildlife sanctuary, a river gorge nature reserve, or there's also ocean parks. And you can see here that there's a park which is a marine park. So typically this is what we mean by protected areas. Now, dialing back a bit, the, the headline aims that governments are, are aiming for combines the following things. Economic growth is, of course, often the first thing that people need. At the same time, we've all become aware of the risks of climate change, including economic risks. And so we need to slow climate change. We also need to slow biodiversity loss. And again, this has become an economic issue. The World Economic Forum has now stated that biodiversity loss ranks amongst the top five risks to the global economy. So it's not just about losing species, it's about economic loss as well. And this, and of course then with the COVID-19 epidemic, we are hoping for better human health and well-being. All of these things tend to balance out and trade off. And the question was how these all reflect on the CBD policy process. The CBD is the the international process by which the governments sit down and agree this strategic plan. So what happens if we aim to protect 30% of land and sea to all of these various goals? And as I said, you would expect trade-offs to some degree. So what we've typically assumed historically is the following, that if we have lots of economic growth, it tends to be bad for climate change, bad for biodiversity loss, and we're not quite sure what happens with human health. Yes, greater wealth leads to greater health, but there's also lots of evidence coming out of the coronavirus pandemic that as you destroy nature, that leads to more epidemics. So health is an open question there. Conversely, the idea has typically been if we protect more of nature and therefore perhaps slow down climate change, doesn't that mean the economy is going to slow down? Surely nature and the economy trade off against each other. So this is the, the traditional point of view. Um, what we did is we went in and we looked essentially at where protected areas are. Now, typically, of course, they're either in rural areas or in coastal areas, especially if you've got a marine protected area. So, and a great deal of the biodiversity on the planet is in developing countries. And so our interest is really in developing economies 
and especially the rural and coastal sectors within those economies, bearing in mind that often it's the rural sector that's one of the big drivers in developing economies. So that means the part of the world economy that we're looking at is the combination of agriculture, fisheries, tourism, which in developing countries is often in natural areas, forestry, and sometimes um, oil or mining extraction. So what the report did is it gathered together experts in all of these fields, and it said, what would happen to all of these if we expanded protected areas to 30%? So there's the question, what would happen, especially to economic output? That's really our headline interest. What happens to economic output if we expand protected areas to 30%? Now just start with what we found, and then I'll explain how we got there. So what we found is that economic output in the rural and coastal sectors would increase globally. Climate change and ecosystem loss would slow. And additionally, in terms of economic growth, we found that protected areas as an economic sector would have a growth rate of some eight to 10 times more than all of the alternatives, the alternatives being things like fisheries, forestry, and agriculture. So essentially, what we're looking at is a rather surprising result that apparently protecting more of the earth leads to more economic output and an improvement in biodiversity and climate change. And this is almost certainly your immediate response. How is that possible? Isn't nature protection the opposite of economic production? Surely it's a trade-off. How is this going to work? So this is essentially how it works. As I said, you've got all these different sectors. You've got the agriculture sector, of course, cities, which we're not particularly focused on because very few of them have large protected areas. The protected area sector itself, fisheries and forestry represented here by logging. And then there's a certain amount of land which is this patch of green in the bottom, which is not yet really used for anything. Now, each of those sectors generates an economic output. And you might ask yourself, well, how do protected areas generate an economic output? Well, essentially, people visit them. And this is primarily the, the driver of economic benefits. So they'll stay in the local hotels, they'll eat in the local restaurants, they'll create jobs, there'll be tours that go in. And there was a recent study by Cambridge that suggested that the um, protected area visits alone might be worth $600 billion a year. Um, in addition to which, there's now an increasing amount of payment for carbon credits and the water services that protected areas provide, such as cleaning the drinking water for cities. So all of these actually generate dollar amounts, if you're thinking in dollars. And the question is, what happens to the bottom line if I add up all of the agriculture, all of the protected area economies, all of the fisheries, and all of the forestry? Now, here comes the tricky bit. I can expand, and I will need to expand in the future as the human population gets bigger. If I expand forestry, what happens? Does the economy increase? Well, presumably, yes. If I expand agriculture, does the economy increase? Well, presumably, yes. If I expand a protected area, does the economy increase? Presumably, yes. But of course, they're all competing with each other. So if I expand agriculture, I can't then have a protected area in the same place. So the question is, if I add 30% protected areas, what's the total of all of those sectors added together? Now, I'm just gonna say that again because it's really important. Agriculture, forestry, and protected areas on land between them add up to a total economic output. I could expand agriculture in the future to feed more people. I could expand forestry into currently unused areas to generate more forest products. And 
I could expand protected areas. And in this case, I could put them in a little corner away from all of the areas that I might otherwise want to use. And the question is, what happens to the economy? Well, presumably agriculture goes up a bit, forestry goes up a bit, protected areas goes up a very small amount because what I've done is I've created a small area that's a long way away from any center of tourism. Now, here's your alternative. Again, I have lots of unused natural land. Let's imagine this time that I expand agriculture and forestry, but this time I expand protected areas quite a lot more, and I expand them essentially closer to some of the tourism areas. What happens now is that I get more income from agriculture, more income from forestry, and quite a lot more income from protected areas. And so on the bottom line, it turns out that I'm doing better. Now, that's just revenues. That's essentially economic output. What you're looking at here is a picture of a storm surge from a hurricane. These can do an awful lot of damage, as you can see. This is what happens when you get storm surges. And this is the sort of damage they can do. It runs into the millions of dollars. In the tropics, if you have one of these in the way of a storm surge, this is a mangrove forest, then it dramatically reduces the impact of the waves and saves you millions of dollars that you would either have to use to build artificial barriers against the waves or in repairing the damage. So there's a lot of money to be saved by having natural areas too. Similarly, this is what deforestation looks like. In it, and this is what happens in India when the forests in the mountains surrounding the cities are cut down. You get enormous flooding, again, millions of dollars worth of damage. So there are actually two types of economic benefit here. One is what some people might call real money, which is where you get the income from the agriculture, the income from the forestry. The other is this idea of you're saving money by not having all of that damage from storm surges. And what we did is we worked out if we expand protected areas, will the revenues go up or down? Will the cost savings go up or down? And how much would money would be needed to do it? So there's the expansion. And this is what happens. On average, if you expand the protected areas, the revenue, the real money, if you like, goes up by about $250 billion a year globally. The cost savings, I, sorry, I should have said it could go up to as much as 500 if you put protected areas in certain key areas. The cost savings, and this is only in the tropics, would be about another $350 billion a year. For comparison, the average investment you'd need to do it would be about $140 billion a year. So as you can see, essentially you have an increase in what we might call real money, an increase in these cost savings from um, preventing climate change and flooding and things like that, and a much smaller cost. Now, this seems to give essentially an argument for doing it. And as you can see, it's the opposite of what your first instinct might have been. You're actually doing better economically. And finally, it's important not just that you should have current revenue, but that you should pick parts of the economy that are going to grow. And this is particularly key in the wake of COVID because we will need rapid economic growth. So we compared the rates of economic growth across these four systems. We found that fisheries are likely to decline in time. Agriculture has been growing at about half percent a year in its revenues and will continue to do so. Forestry, very similar. Protected areas is growing at about 5% a year, and that could actually be higher the more protected areas you have. So in terms of actually picking a future growth sector, expanding protected areas was also economically valid. So our bottom line was 
there seems to surprisingly be a small but growing economic benefit from expanding protected areas for the simple reason that you bring in more revenue from the protected areas and save yourselves an awful lot of costs related to climate change, biodiversity loss, flooding, and other eco economic impacts. That's all, and thank you. Thank you, uh, Anthony, Professor Waldron. That was an excellent talk. I think it, uh, it comes at a great moment mm -hmm. because we are witnessing that, you know, as countries want to go back to normal, that normal is a loss of uh, revenue for fishing. There's, you know, uh, overfishing in most of the fisheries globally. And that going back to normal means pollution that will drive us over the edge towards climate change. So obviously this comes at an excellent time. Uh, Cynthia, you wanted to uh, give us some information. Sure, thanks Marcelo. Uh, if those of you from the audience wish to ask a question or make a comment, please send it to our Twitter account, which is at LATAMPROG, L-A-T-A-M-P-R-O-G, and we'll be happy to take up your questions after the presentations. Thank you. Thank you. So moving on uh, into the panel section, in which we'll have um, around eight minutes per speaker, and I'll be uh, keeping time uh, on that. Um, we have, uh, first off, uh, uh, President uh, Jose Maria Figueres, uh, whom I met a couple of years ago in, in, in a big oceans conference, and I thought uh, it was amazing to hear what he can bring to the table as a former president of Costa Rica. Uh, Costa Rica has been a regional leader in environmental sustainability issues for a while. It's sort of the country identity. Uh, you were pioneers for paying for ecosystem services to, so people would not cut down their trees to recover uh, forestry capacity. You were the first and only country in Central America to reverse deforestation. And looking back, um, you know, there's, there's this Pura Vida identity that Costa Rica has in terms of prosperity, well-being. Do you think this vision has uh, allowed you to have more tourism, more agriculture, more uh, Forestry has that bet for the protecting natural capital uh, paid off in the end. So definitely, yes. Uh, Marcelo, thank you very much uh, for uh, inviting us on the panel. Uh, Anthony, fantastic report. Uh, thank you for your very thorough work. I enjoyed the sector by sector analysis in it. Uh, and you're proving that good environment means good economics. And thank you to the Wilson Center as well. So Marcelo, to your question, I think that very early on in our history of the last 30 or 40 or 50 years, we were able to put together more by coincidence and perhaps luck at the beginning than by design, a set of public policies through which the environment and our economic development came together. And I can give you examples of that that are very concrete. With respect to energy, Costa Rica began to invest very early on in renewable sources of energy. And today, 100% of our electricity is renewable based on hydro, geothermal, solar, and wind power. Now working to decarbonize the transportation sector. Uh, about 30 years ago, we began developing our national park system. And then a few years later discovered that the national parks were the economic engine of our ecotourism, which allowed us to brand the country in that direction. Ecotourism up until the crisis was the second dollar earner for Costa Rica and the first job creator in rural areas. And through our national parks, by the way, Costa Rica has already achieved the objective that Anthony talks about of preserving 30% of our territory. We still need to work on our ocean, but that is work on progress. And the third example that I would mention is the one you brought up, Marcelo, which is what we put together when we were in government, which was a system for the payment of, of environmental services. So back in 96, we slapped a tax on fossil fuels of 7.5% and took the proceeds from that tax into 
an environmental service fund, FONAFIFO, that began to purchase environmental services in terms of reforestation, in terms of watershed protection from small farmers around the country. And that is in fact how we reversed the deforestation of our country uh, and became green again in terms of our natural growth. Now, was it easy? No, it wasn't. Imagine yourself uh, 25 years ago, slapping a tax on fossil fuel, arguing that when you buy gasoline or diesel at the pump, you need to already be purchasing the cost of absorbing the carbon back out of the atmosphere that you're going to cause by your engines running. People called us crazy. At the end of 25 years, we all understand it. Uh, we all are for it. And if anything, FONAFIFO, the Environmental Services Fund Purchasing Agency, needs to reinforce its budget today to be able to acquire more environmental services. But uh, being able to do these things always, always juxtapose the short-term pressures that governments are faced with when taking medium and long-term decisions uh, in favor of development, such as the ones that I have mentioned. And I think it's very important that this particular juncture of the present crisis, when we're all concentrating on short-term solutions to our health challenges, that we at the same time do not let go of a medium and long-term vision in terms of the direction that we have to need, uh, that we need to come out of the crisis um, as we go forward. And this is a critical decade. What we do between 2020 and 2030 will make or break uh, our, our possibilities in the next decades. We need to decouple carbon emissions right now from development that have always been parallel and allow development to move forward while carbon emissions come down so that we can address the two major challenges we have today. One, poverty and inequity, for which we have a lot more economic might and technology to fight. And the other one, of course, climate change, that is such a detrimental factor on the ocean, our most important ecosystem in our life. Um, Anthony mentioned the WEF signaling biodiversity, the loss of biodiversity, as one of the five top important threats we uh, face today. And he went into length in terms of sharing how preserving 30% of the planet would work in favor of our economics. It makes absolute sense, just as we have proven in Costa Rica, to link environment with good economics. And I finish by saying, Marcelo, that there are two things that we can do this same year, one at the global level and one at the Latin American level. So at the global level, we have CAMLAR, who will meet again in Hubbard, Australia in October or November. In front of CAMLAR, we have three marine protected areas, East Antarctica, the Weddell Sea, and the Antarctic Peninsula, that if we approve them as marine protected areas around Antarctica, where all of the biodiversity is in that continent, in the seas around it, we would be approving the single most important and large ever track of preservation in the history of humanity, four million square kilometers. That would go a long way to reaching 30% of the ocean protected by 2030. And in the case of Latin America, a couple of years ago, Mexico declared the archipelago of Revilla Gijero as a national marine protected area. Think of a Latin America coming together to create a common international marine protected area that goes all the way from Revilla Gijero in Mexico down through Cocos Island in Costa Rica, Coiba, Panama, Malpelo, Colombia, Galápagos, Ecuador, all the way to Juan Fernández in Chile. 
What an example for the world and what a fantastic opportunity for Latin America. So yes, let's conserve 30% of our territory and 30% of our ocean because it makes absolute economic sense. Thank you uh, so much, uh, President. That was brilliant and also very uh, stuck to time. What a pro. But uh, also um, it's been, um, yeah, you, so your country has adopted this net zero emissions. Costa Rica is the first country in Latin America to commit to net zero emissions by 2050. Chile was the second one um, also, and which goes to show that we have a lot of leadership on the table here regarding these issues. Your your sister, Cristiana Pilleres, is the architect of the Paris Agreement. And obviously hanging out with your family as I did in Costa Rica is, is something, you know, you could take so many lessons home on how to really move uh, forward in making changes across the world. In this regard, I had the privilege of, uh, of working hand in hand with uh, Chris Tompkins in, in Chile. In the, she is the president of uh, Tompkins Conservation and she, uh, also was formerly the CEO of Patagonia. And she has been uh, selected to be the UN um, uh, UNEP ambassador, UN environment ambassador for protected areas. And uh, the story of uh, Kristen and, and Doug, her, her, uh, her husband, uh, has been very uh, strong and emotional in, in Chile overall. Uh, you both together delivered the largest philanthropic donation of land for conservation the world has ever had. And you convinced the government of Chile to follow your lead on collectively creating the biggest national parks of the Americas this century. Uh, initially, your vision was met with distrust and conspiracy theories even. Chile has recently em had recently emerged from a brutal dictatorship and had high levels of poverty. Yet you persevered, persevered in the sense that your parks now symbolize the end of large hydro projects in Patagonia and opening up um, a revolution of energy investments of over $20 billion this last decade. So looking back, as you consider this new research, has uh, your dream provided more well-being, more, well, uh, more income, more sustainability to Chile than before? And also in light of this COVID crisis, what can we learn from your lessons on what the green recovery should look like moving forward? Mm. Lots of questions. I'm so old, Marcella, you're going to have to remind me of those sect the sectional questions in your comments. Um, yes. First of all, Anthony, thank you for this report. Uh, our teams, I have been going through it like a gopher and uh, it, it has been an extraordinary stake in the ground for those of us who are looking at 20, 30, 30% and going half earth to 50, but we'll park 250, 2050 to the side. Wilson Center, thank you for including me. I want to say, before I get to one of your answers, Marcelo, I want to say one thing, just to preface and listening to everyone and having gone through the, the report, everything that we're talking about is based on our value system that is anthropocentric, right? We have, as conservationists, been forced to use absolutely the primary argument in favor of conservation, which is it is an economic driver. So I just want to say these are judged by human benefits, but let's remember there are two values that we always have to carry forward, and that is that all life has intrinsic value all its own it needn't have us to lay that value on top of them. And secondly, that beauty as a value matters. And if you ask anyone around the world, they will tell you about the beauty or the destruction of that beauty um, because it's in our skin. So while we are talking about the economic benefits, I just wanted to remind ourselves that there, there are much deeper, broader, wider, more deep, heartfelt that goes along with the economic drivers. So yes, we started in, uh, Doug and I were both refugees from the business community. Doug was the founder of North Face and then Esprit. And I uh, started with Yvonne when he wanted 
to start making clothes for, for climbers and ski racers like us. And I was the CEO there for a very long time. And, and we both left our business lives and went to Chile and Argentina to start really the acquisition of land and, and the, the permanent protection for large scale ecosystems. And we, we expanded within Chile. And yes, you're right, Marcelo, the, the, the response to us was, was quick and furious for the first five years. Um, I think that would have happened anywhere. And today I look back on it uh, with real deep understanding about all of that. And then we moved our, expanded into Argentina. I have a map here that somebody could throw up for a minute and just to give our viewers a sense of all of our projects between Northern Argentina and down uh, to Cape Horn. <clears throat> You'll see a few marine, uh, these are marine parks. These are no take zones that we were able to put together on the Atlantic side of the oceans. Um, a year and a half ago. So this is this is where we've been working. We've created 13 new national parks between the two countries, a total of a little uh, less than 15 million acres. But 15 years ago, we began to look at our work with absolutely new eyes. When somebody mentioned to us that landscape without wildlife is just scenery. And it was it was a it was a, an epiphany for us. And from that point forward, wherever we work, we, we go in and do, do the analysis, who's missing. In Northern Argentina, we're bringing back jaguars into an area where they've been extirpated since the 1930s. Um, same thing down in the South where you see we have more national parks. Uh, anyway, you can get rid of the map if you like. <laughs> um, so the evolution of our work has really been pretty rapid. Um, I, I'm not sure if you want to ask me something more specific. So I take good no, use. So I, mean, I think what, one of the things that I see uh, in, as a definition of the national parks was you know, there, there used to be a lot of plans for big hydro dams where you had your parks. Yeah. And you supported the Patagonia Sin Represas movement, which really spurred the renewable energy revolution. Because we, as many people do, did the right thing after we exhausted all the wrong things. We tried coal, we tried hydro, and then all of a sudden we're like, okay, we'll do well, uh, solar. And, uh, but, it, but it really was a revolution. How do, you, how do you think of that, you know, how that vision change because it was a place that people had their eyes on. They wanted to cut down the trees, they wanted to do the hydro. They didn't see the national parks as a vision. So how, how do you see that in hindsight, the shift that you caused in the identity, the energy identity uh, in that discussion that Chile has adopted? Well, like all revolutions, and I would count this as a small revolution as revolutions go, there is there are invisible tipping points in any country, in any organization, when the social, cultural, political, emotional uh, standards are shifting around. And I think when it came to protecting those rivers in an area of a country where the vast majority of Chileans have never visited and may not visit necessarily, there is that moment when it's just too much that taking something pristine and turning it into something that at least in the in the minds of the citizenry was to just fuel the mines in the north. So you have the juxtaposition of serious, long-term, deep uh, destruction that went by a zipper for 2,500 miles up to the north of the country for an industry that already had uh, 
uh, difficult relationship with local people and, and people throughout Chile. It was an industry that wherever it goes, there are pros and cons to it and it creates conflict. So I just think it's one of those times, I know that we get credited a lot for somehow saving these rivers, but this is the point about Chile. Chilean citizens, the citizens of Santiago saved that river, those rivers, because at a time, probably the first time since Pinochet left office, there were a hundred thousand people out marching in the streets of Santiago. Now, a hundred thousand people today, considering the marches that we've been watching with Greta, and then of course the social unrest today, 100,000 people doesn't sound like much, but in that moment, in that city, this was extraordinary. And I think it was a tectonic shift in the way that people would think about themselves thinking about being responsible for what happens in their country and that they do have a voice. This, they, they sort of found their voice again. So uh, I, I think this is the economics of the creation of national parks, the, 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 the idea that they are clearly economic drivers for local economies, that we've seen hands down. And of course, this wasn't new. If you look at West Yellowstone, if you look at um, Nairobi, if you look at... Um, Tanzania as a country, these things have begun to make tremendous sense. I think that the longevity of conservation for me is more concerning. Uh, the, the short term, I think the arguments are there and I certainly know that territory is there and I'm talking about the key territory. There are ways to get to 30% and not just have it the 30% that nobody wants, which is the big fear. My, my big challenge for our own projects, the new ones we have rolling out and the ones we've done before, is if we assume a growing human population and a growing consumption level and a falling rate of national resources, how do you protect these things long-term? How long can you go just on the economic arguments for these large territories, whether it's in the sea or, or, or terrestrial? So this is one of the real reasons for me that this report is so important, but I think, I hope that it's the first analysis and that keeps going because this is a mouse with a very long tail and the, the, the trends toward the necessity for protecting all these big areas has to be part and parcel with identifying what should the 30% be and so on and so forth, because the pressure is ever building. So that's it. Thank you so much, Chris. And it, it is true. Um, people saw it was too much and the citizens did put down seven gigawatts of coal-fired energy. Had we had that, you know, we would be in big trouble. Uh, you know, Chilean exports would be super exposed to uh, taxes like the EU is putting out now uh, for imports of, uh, you know, embodied energy. So just even in the pragmatic terms, it was just a great decision. But also those same transmission lines that we are building for bringing that coal energy now brings in solar energy and opening up a new revolution on hydro hydrogen energy that we are trying to uh, push forward. And I just wanted to thank you again because you and Sylvia, who's the next speaker, uh, and Michelle Bachelet uh, were at that ceremony in which we signed all these new decrees into, into, into uh, law, and which was really emotional for my whole family, probably the highlight of my career. Uh, and that regard, I'd also like to highlight that leadership that Michelle did also. And the vision was, you were the land protection and Sylvia was the ocean uh, protector. Uh, maybe it was just uh, me and with my uh, comic book, uh, her you know, hero uh, mentality, but I'd like to uh, now introduce uh, Sylvia Earl. 
Sylvia, you know, you were a pioneer in ocean exploration and the and you have seen things change rapidly within your lifetime. You've seen those changes in, in a negative way. You've seen some recoveries too. You were the first woman chief scientist for NOAA. You've advised world leaders protecting the ocean. What are the next frontiers we should be looking into? What are your current uh, uh, priorities? Should we go to the Antarctic? Should we do uh, protect the high seas? Where are the new protected areas we should be looking into? And you've always been ahead of the curve. So where do we go now? You, you got the mic on, you got to turn on the mic, sorry. I can drive submarines, but I, still have to master the mute button. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you, Marcelo, and thank you, Wilson Center, for hosting this and including me, and Anthony for a masterful look at the traditional questions that people ask. You know, it's, it's about value. It's about the economics of why we should care about the natural world. But they are, as Jose Maria and as Christine articulated, their other values, and we haven't properly accounted for nature. We've taken nature for granted. Uh, from the standpoint of the ocean, we still account for fish with a zero accounting base. Fish are free. You know, there's an investment in going out to catch them, kill them, and send them to market. But we don't put on the balance sheet the loss when something is taken from the sea. It's all about, it's there, it's free. We used to think of trees that way. We're getting a little better about the land, but Somehow, if you run a business the way we treat the natural world, we would have been, well, we are going bankrupt because we haven't accounted properly for the assets, if you think of it in a business sense. So, priorities. Here we are, early 21st century armed with the most powerful thing that humans have, and that's the gift of knowledge, of knowing not only what no other creatures on the planet can know. I mean, whales are smart, elephants are really smart. I mean, animals have their own intelligence, but what no other humans could know until right about now. The, I mean, the smartest people who've ever lived cannot know, could not know, what the children of today grow up knowing, what Earth looks like from space, that there are people on the other side of the planet and what they look like, that we share a certain common base while at the same time we all have differences that should be respected and that are part of what makes us strong, diversity. I heard President Piñera, Sebastián Piñera of Chile, and President Barack Obama similarly observed that this is the first time in history that we can know the magnitude of the problems we face. It may be the last time that we have to do something about it. This is more than an economic issue. This is a survival issue. It was that view of Earth from space. It was, you know, 51 years ago that that image of in all the universe, this is, this is our home and it is vulnerable. So in 2020, we had a real wake-up call, Earth, we, on the planet. We are vulnerable to things we can't control. Well, we can, in a sense, but we must respect the laws of nature, first and foremost. We see it 
with climate change. We see it with the diversity of life, but we could not see it until right about now, and not everybody sees it even so. The knowledge is there. It's acting on the knowledge that is available to us for the first time. We have that gift of being able to look at the whole world and to share knowledge instantly around the world, well, in near time anyway. At the same time that we're making new discoveries, we don't have to wait as Gregor Mendel did when he made this breakthrough in genetics about the work that he did in his monastery garden that transformed the way we understand genetics and all that. 35 years before even his scientific community took seriously his discovery about the genetics and how it functions in some basic ways. We don't have 35 years, we may not even have 10, to take seriously and act seriously on the knowledge that we have and realizing the magnitude of what we still don't know. But armed with what we do know, to seriously take to heart that climate is changing, always has, always will, with us or without us. But our ability to influence the basic systems that make our lives on Earth possible, it's beyond economics. It's called, do we take seriously Earth as a miraculous exception in the universe, Earth, a place where life exists, Earth, a place that took four and a half billion years to shape into a place that is hospitable for civilization as we know it. It's taken us about four and a half decades to significantly unravel those basic systems. When I look at what we've done to the land, look at what we've done to the diversity, the diversity loss of something on the order of a thousand times faster than the natural rate of biodiversity loss. I mean, species come and species go, systems come, systems go, but over long periods of geological time, you know, there's a gradual process and nature comes back. And there have been five major times of extinction in the past, not by us, but by things that we couldn't control. But we can control the sixth extinction that is happening now because of us. Why isn't this a headline in the Wall Street Journal, in Financial Times? I mean, why? It's getting there. I mean, I have to say, I'm. on one hand, I get... <laughs> overwhelmed with despair, but we can't just let that happen. We have to look at the positive side at the World Economic Forum this year for the first time, really acknowledging uh, the carbon in Wales <laughs> and the carbon issue as an economic issue in a more serious way than ever before. Biodiversity in a more serious way than ever before. Uh, the climate conference, the first blue cup, putting into perspective the importance of the ocean as it relates to climate. I mean, there is cause for hope. I'm looking at you, Kristen, cause for hope, and you, Jose Maria, you, Anthony and Marcelo, all of them. And I look out across the world, the children of today, cause for hope. We have knowledge that not only did not but could not exist until right about now. So what should we be doing? Yes, fully embrace at least protection for 30% of the planet by 2030. And, and there is cause for hope because look at what Chile has already done in the coastal areas as well as on the land, private and public support, governments coming together for the first time in a way that go back 50 years ago would seem totally uh, impossible.
but we don't have another 50 years or maybe even 10 to take to heart, to take seriously the knowledge that we now have that we are in trouble. Earth is in trouble. The earth systems that keep us alive, that make it possible for us to breathe, that make possible our prosperity, they are very much at risk. The opportunities we currently have on the high seas, you know, nature doesn't understand that we've carved up the world. I mean, birds don't know, whales don't know, trees don't know where we put our boundaries. But as humans, speaking for nature, speaking for the the condition of the world that we share with the rest of life on earth. Okay, we have these boundaries and within those boundaries we have certain power. And in Chile, the power to protect on the land, okay, that's solid, you can buy land, you can you know, work within that system. What about the ocean? You can't buy a chunk of the ocean but you can exert government power backed by people power to initiate protection or not. And when you think about what we've, where we are right now, the goal was 10% by 2020. Well, we're not quite there, even if you are the most generous in terms of, of um, assigning protection to managed areas that aren't really protected, then we have a little more than 7%. Maybe by the end of the year, we'll get to the UN goal for 10% by 2020. And maybe we'll get to the more ambitious goal by today's standards of 30% by 2030. But if we take seriously where we are, in terms of planetary degradation, biodiversity loss, of warming of the planet like this, how much is enough? I mean, the more we can embrace with care as if our lives depend on it, everything we care about depends on our power, our capacity to take seriously the knowledge that we have and while we identify these critical places for enhanced protection we must develop that ethic of caring for all of it how much is enough how much can we sacrifice how much can we lose well how much have we already lost presently less than 3% of the ocean is embraced with a high degree of care. That means like 97% of the ocean is open for fish to take, exploitation. Yes, we have some certain guidelines, particularly overarching ones for species that we have come to care about, marine mammals. And we assign now new values to whales. Oh, carbon-based units like trees. You know, if you lose the whales, you, you release carbon into the atmosphere, you cut the trees, you put carbon into the atmosphere and you lose the systems that are, that have developed over gazillions of years to capture the carbon, to create this planet that works in our favor. Okay, so if whales have value, what about tuna? What about krill? What about every other carbon-based unit in the ocean? We think of them as commodities. We don't think of them as anything but commodities, wildlife. No, they're not, they're, they're something that we have an obligation to take. I mean, we need to rethink our rationale about the ocean. We rethink the way we value life in the ocean. We need to rethink the way we look at the ocean. The ocean is not just rocks and water with a few fish swimming around. The ocean is, it's organic. It's an organic material. Every, every cup of water is loaded with viruses. We're talking billions, bacteria, 
and the cornerstone of our life support system. We need to think differently. That's the revolution that we need, to embrace nature not as a nice thing, not as an optional thing, having protected areas because it makes us feel good. It makes us say, you look, we're, we're taking care of, of those other creatures who share of the planet with us. Well, yeah, that's our life support system that we're taking care of. We need to understand that. Kids are beginning to get it because they arrive in a world and are learning along with their letters and their numbers, they're learning that the natural world is, is important to our existence. I didn't know that as a kid. Nobody really took it as seriously as this growing force that we have to reckon with. Fortunately, it is there. And it isn't just the children coming along who see Earth from space as a part of their, of their <laughs> knowing. It's the grown-ups too. It's the people I'm looking at on the screen. You know what our predecessors could not know. And we have to amp up where our, our objectives. 30% is a great start. 30% is vital, but it is not enough. So I'm here to say thank you for putting numbers on nature why it matters to our economy as we measure value today. And we've got to get over just putting an economic dollar sign on, or whatever sign you wish to assign to it around the world. I, I think that our focus today, looking at Latin America, is again, a great place to start. And looking at Antarctica and the opportunities that are right on the table right now, to embrace seriously, but why, in the sense, I, I want to say, why, why do we stop? Why, why do we just say 30%? Why are we allowing fishing to take place in Antarctica at all? What, mm. How did that start? Why, why can't we rethink the greater importance of the natural living systems and the short-term extractive industries that will come and go and leave behind a hole in that vital system, our life support system that keeps our prosperity in place. So I think my job is to be a little provocative, to say we're heading in the right direction, but let that not be the end point. Let that be a way station toward where we really need to respect and care for all of the natural world, land and sea and air, water, whatever, as if our lives depend on it, because they do. And, and, I, and I do wanna thank you for, for that vision in the sense that it's true that for some people, the economic evidence will suffice and will be necessary. When you wanna do this against ministers that are voting against their sectors, according to their lobbyists, you know, it's something that you need to have on mind, but also there's a moral reason to do it. And obviously the short-term thinking does outweigh the long-term thinking. And the, there's ever been an example is the COVID crisis in which, you know, shut down a little while, massive devastation, and then you're out hanging out with your friends without, you know, so we, we still got a long ways to go in terms of trying to provide that long-term vision, obviously uh, in, in light of this. And if this was a rehearsal, for a climate crisis, we didn't do very well. And one added piece about the current threats that we have an opportunity to address in the high seas, in the deep seas. Deep sea mining is on the table for consideration now October when the International Seabed Authority will meet and decide yes, no, maybe, about assigning leases to mine the deep sea or to have a moratorium for the next 10 years by 2030. I certainly urge the moratorium until we at least know better than we now do about what's there, but the arrogance of saying it doesn't matter that what we can extract from the deep sea must take priority 
in the short term, but the long-term consequences, just as the early days of deforestation. You know, if you could go back even 50 years, let alone go back 500 years, armed with what we now know, <laughs> what might we do differently? Thank you, Sylvia, so much for your comments. And so we have time for a couple um, of questions. I'm, I'm very little time over, overall. Just one question that we're going to uh, provide him and maybe, uh, you know, even uh, to the, for, uh, and maybe have Max uh, respond to Ambassador uh, Manes's, uh, uh, Jane Manes uh, on the, can, you know, in your, in your remarks, I think you will talk about it. Can you discuss priorities of combating illegal, unreported, unregulated fishing in the hemisphere? particularly to the Galapagos. So I think in what you speak, uh, I was going to say Gonzalo, the, other, the climate champion, Max, the ocean champion, if you could say that. But I, I just wanted to ask one question to, to uh, if, if uh, Anthony could uh, answer just a brief question I have in the top of my mind, which is, you know, you put out this report, uh, you know, brief, brief uh, response. What um, has been the response to the study uh, from the different sectors? Have they embraced it? Are they having concerns? Where do you go from now? Because obviously this goes into a COP26 year, a transcendental year, which we define new climate goals and new biodiversity goals. And the UK is really vested in having a successful, successful COP with biodiversity objectives uh, met. Where do we go from here? And what has been the response been, Anthony? I'm afraid I can't give you a good answer to that um, for the simple reason that I have not heard a great deal from the main policy areas yet about how they would respond to this study. I think perhaps it's unfair in two weeks since its publication to have expected that. But so far, um, we're still waiting for the questions to come in. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, uh, so then thank you for, for that. Uh, I'll give a now for Max Bello. Max Bello, a good friend of ours, uh, just a closing remarks. Uh, and thank you, thank you everybody for, uh, for participating in this, so thanks to the Wilson Center. We'll give this uh, final uh, remarks to Max Bello, who is an advisor to Mission Blue, but also a global champion on the oceans, a uh, new father, uh, which is probably the most important title he has now. So Max, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Marcelo. And I'm super happy. You know, we've been um, in, in so many things, um, creating this space also for having this conversation and calling the attention of the world. I think this is an incredible group. Um, I just want to start saying that the other day when uh, my daughter, new daughter, uh, we have with Brett now called Willow, Alice, Alice for for Sylvia actually too, in, on her honor too, we put her name, second name. I, I um, came into the idea of actually start donating monthly to our local park, Rock Creek Park. We, it's been a refuge for us. It's been a place where we've been going every time we can um, during this crisis. It's been such a beautiful place. And I can't even imagine not having this place. I can't even imagine like what people do in big cities where they don't have any space like that to go out. I mean, how much you can actually value those things, no? And it, it is... I think in this crisis also we've been we've seen how important those places are for us. We can reach them, you know, we, you want to go to the beach, maybe you want to go to this park, you want to go somewhere else, you can go there now. And having those places around your house, is, it's just incredible. And I think it's just beautiful to see all this group of people talking, people that have actually doing things. I mean, uh, with President Figueres, we've been fighting a lot of battles and also we've been celebrating different um, successful campaigns to, together uh, around the globe and in Latin America in particular. So it's a pleasure always to, to be received, well received in, in Costa Rica, a place that I've been visiting so many times that have incredible lead. And in connecting, I think that what you talk about, the connection with these other areas, that is exactly what we should be doing. We should be thinking about what the ecosystem needs. It's beyond the administrative or administration sort of borders of countries. The sharks that are swimming between these areas, they don't know the definition of the, those areas. They don't know the definition of borders. 
We've seen actually now these days in Galapagos, this incredible fleet of more than 260 vessels from China that actually have been fishing in that area outside of this area. But they're the same sharks that actually we dive with in uh, Galapagos or many other species. Um, what are the chances they're actually going to get to the other side to go to these heaven places that we call now marine protected areas? They're not enough. They're definitely not enough. 2.9% of the ocean is highly and fully protected. As Sylvia said, I mean, it's 97% of the ocean is to sell, is for business. That can be right. I mean, we need to do something about that. What about the high seas? There's still no regulation. The RFMOLOSI, Regional Organizations of Fisheries, actually they hardly can manage couple of species. So we're far behind. And I think we are in a moment of questioning ourselves. Chris, you are, you know, you have been always an incredible um, inspiration to myself. I mean, to my family. I, I went visiting uh, you guys, you and I, when I was 22 years old. And you invited me to stay there. So I, I quit my studies for a year and I stayed there for one year and I worked making trails in that incredible place that I, I can't think of any other more beautiful place on earth that you have been protecting. Incredible place, beautiful. And um, for you, Sylvia, you have been, um, you know, incredible for uh, all of us. Your words always resonate uh, on, on, on all of us. And I want to connect these two incredible um, uh, women to, and I want to ask, like, how are we actually looking? For example, the Patagonia. Patagonia, you know, we were uh, about to visit Patagonia on an expedition with Sylvia. We had to cut just in March. And we were planning, actually, to see eventually uh, Sil um, Chris and, you know, Carolina. By the way, Chris have incredible team, Carolina Morgado and others, they're working there. And amigos de, de los parques, and um, we couldn't because of the crisis. But we were thinking of going there. Is it, for example, that we are sacrificing this incredible landscape and ecos massive ecosystem of Patagonia for a salmon farming production? I mean, we need to question what is really what need to be actually the core of the development um, of this region. It's clearly not salmon farming. It is around conservation. There's so much, many more opportunities. And in this crisis, we need to understand that. Marcelo, you've been incredible. We work together also to get those parks and those places to, to be done. You had the strength to actually go ahead to convince everyone with also um, Minister Munoz and others, but you were the keystone for that. It's such a pleasure to keep working with you and see that you, you have your heart in the right place for that. Anthony, it is amazing what you've done, I think, bringing all of this um, information and, and the key element of this CVD next question. This is a key element. We need to extend our protected areas, whether it's in land or it's in, in the ocean, for any reason needed. But I tell you what, those places are the key for life in, in Earth, on Earth. There's no good or bad or unemployment, you, you know, there's no good or bad um, work. There's no unemployment on a dead planet. There's no good or bad economy on a, on a dead uh, planet. So we have big tasks, and I just want to finish with this. We have, and you, you guys that you're looking at this, you're following, and I really thank uh, the Wilson Center, Anders and Cynthia, but I want to remind, remind everyone, high seas are unprotected there's still no way to protect them. There is no regulation. There is no way that we can create marine protected areas. Biggest part of the ocean is out there and is being taken for free, basically from the countries that are highly subsidizing those fisheries. Subsidies, the WTO now working in also on defining how we can cut those subsidies, those negative subsidies. Let's move them into the right place. Let's move that money into actually build up our ecosystem again and to recover, to rewild, to, you know, the natural based solutions. That's what we need now. Antarctica, we are, we have a lack of protecting areas in Antarctica. We need to get this new three marine protected areas, Chile and Argentina in particular, 
there because it's my country, Chile, have an incredible role on bringing one more marine protected area. It will be incredible, incredible news. In other areas as well, Galapagos and other places. So I want to leave you there with all of this task. Guys, follow what is going on. Follow all of these people that are doing incredible things. Um, um, the President Figueres on Antarctica 2020, Chris around the globe also um, trying to call attention for um, for protected areas and, and what a better example you have. Anthony, incredible, you and your team, uh, I mean, the, the number of scientists that were participating and that is just incredible and I think it brings so much attention to this issue. Sylvia, we will keep working uh, every day for creating more marine protected areas and we're going to bring some more in Marcelo. You're the essence with President Figueres of the politician we need. We need to elect politicians that do the right thing. We need to change what is happening with politics. We, the climate change is a political issue and we need to change in order to change the world for better. It's our problem we can solve. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Max. That was a really great <clears throat> final words. I'd like to thank Cindy Anders, uh, for uh, setting up this uh, great talk uh, with, uh, with the Wilson Center and their tech support. Jose Maria, President Figueres, thank you for giving us a great example. Tony, that was an excellent study, came at the excellent point. Uh, Chris, Sylvia, it's been a pleasure working with you, uh, fighting the good fight, because the same way that we are relentless in what we do, there's other people that get up just as early to destroy the environment. So that's why we got to get up there 15 minutes early. It will be there to meet them. So thank you so much. This video will be available um, in the Wilson Center website in a couple of hours. So please share, please share with your kids. I think uh, the things that we heard today are beautiful and very inspiring. So thank you again for this great moment. And I, I thank, I thank uh, the Wilson Center for letting me uh, participate in this great event. Thanks so much. Thank you.